jump right in here so we can uh, go and enjoy it. Um, Book of Revelation, uh, here is the first letter written to the first church, Ephesus. We're just going to deal with this first letter uh, to this church today and pull out a few things. There's a guy named Daryl Johnson, uh, he wrote a book called Discipleship on the Edge, and here's what he says in it. Um, if it ever became illegal in my part of the world, as it actually is in other places at this very moment, to own a complete copy of the Bible... And if the authorities, as an act of mercy, allow me to possess just one book of the Bible for personal use, I would, without hesitation, keep the last, the book of Revelation. Why? Because no other book of the Bible presents the gospel as powerfully as the last book does. No other book of the Bible, in the face of all that threatens to undo us, proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ the way the last book does. And the reason he says that, and what we've been kind of framed uh, generally with the book of Revelation is that it's a book about kind of the end of the world and so we all get intimidated by it. But what, what I've been saying and what I think is true is that it's a book about discipleship uh, across the ages. It was written to a first century culture and so the book cannot mean anything that it wouldn't have meant to those people. They would have had to understand and so a lot of the images in it would have been stock images that they would have understood. They would have understood when, when, when he talks about in, in Revelation 13 a beast crawling out of the sea. They wouldn't have actually expected a literal beast with claws, you know, attacking people. A beast always meant an empire. And so in that culture, they were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Like we said yesterday, John was on the island of Patmos because he refused to worship Caesar. And we're constantly, that's not just a first century thing, that's a now thing. Every day you wake up, you see posters that you drive by. You see television commercials. You have, uh, people have pitched you a frame of life in worship that says, you know, I, I, I need your allegiance. I want your allegiance. Money should have your allegiance. Fame should have your allegiance. Sex should have your allegiance. All of these different things that are constantly pushing you to compromise, compromise. And, and the question becomes, are you going to pinch incense to those things, worship those things, have your life geared around those things, or are you going to allow your life and heart and mind to be revolved around Jesus? And if so, then persecution may come. And so that's what we've been saying. So now he writes these letters to these churches. And these churches, like every single person here, they have some things really right about them. They have their theology right, some of them. Some of them have their theology wrong. They have their actions right, some of them. Some of them have their actions wrong. And he's going to address. He's going to encourage because he's pastoral. And then he's going to, at times, take them to task. And so what we're hoping is that for us, it's going to be different. One church might not apply to us at all. Other churches may. So let's see uh, what he has to say to us. And my prayer is that our hearts and minds would be uh, ready to receive it. Now, chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what it says. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So remember, that was the description of him in chapter 1. Now, in every letter, he's going to take a piece of that description, and he's going to bring it into that particular church. He's going to say, here's what's particularly relevant. And remember we said what was encouraging about the fact that he holds the seven stars is that he's the sovereign controller of the universe over everything that happens. And so, so he knows what's going on in your life. Have you ever had those scenarios in your life where you're feeling completely discouraged or you're questioning things or you have some conversation and you're wondering something about God and then you walk into church and the guy is, happens to be talking exactly about that thing from the Bible or you go to a community group and somebody raises that exact issue and you're like, how did that happen? How is it that I'm just going through this at this particular moment in my life and now we're talking about it in this context? This is because he walks among the golden lampstands, right? This is because he's amidst the church. He's amidst your life. He's not distant from it, so he knows. And when this stuff happens to me, it's oftentimes very powerful that I'll have um, days where I question whether I should be doing what I'm doing as a pastor of a church. And during those times, I'll have someone, you know, I'll, uh, one, one uh, pastor that I know calls it Bread Truck Mondays. And basically, Bread Truck Mondays are the day on Monday after a busy Sunday where all he's seen are people coming up to him with random things. He'll get to Monday and he'll go, should I just get a normal job where I just punch a clock? Maybe I should drive a bread truck. Because in a bread truck, a bread truck smells nice. Uh, bread trucks don't, you know, uh, you know, do bad things. They don't need church discipline. It's just bread. It doesn't talk back to you. You can just tell it what to do and it does what it does and it smells like. So maybe I should just get a normal job punching a clock that doesn't bite back, right? 
And, uh, and there's days like that for me. There's Mondays like that for me. And oftentimes it's on those days that I'll get an email from someone in the church. And they'll just be like, hey, this is how this affected me. This is how my life's getting changed. Someone will come up to me and have this conversation and remind me that what I'm doing is something. Right? And so why does that happen in your life? Why does that happen in my life? Because he walks among us. That's the kind of God he is. He knows when you need an encouraging word. He knows it. Have you had those times in your life? Someone will just come up to you and share with you a word from Scripture that they're like, man, I just feel this for your life, and it just happens to be something that you are wrestling with. Now, this happens many positive ways for me. It's happened a few wonky ways. When I was in college, a guy brought me up to his bedroom, and we started talking about things, and he said, I got a word of the Lord for you, and he opened it up to like Ezekiel, just randomly kind of pointed, and he says, this is your word. I'm like, actually, that has to do with God and Babylon and Israel and exile. That has nothing to do with my life. And he's like, no, it has to do with your life. And then he started kind of doing this to me. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm shooting you with the Holy Spirit machine gun. I'm like, and you're crazy, so I'm out. Uh, so sometimes that goes a little wonky too. So it's not always on point. It's not always on point, but often it can be on point. And God is right in your midst, and he's, uh, he's speaking to you. So that's a good thing. All right. He walks among the seven golden lampstands. Um, verse 2. I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance. So here's a really important thing. Jesus is going to tell them that their theology is good. Oftentimes, here's what happens. There are churches and people who have their theology good, but their works are not there. And when I think about this, here's the thing about Christian faith. Yes, of course, it's by grace which you can't earn. Yes, of course, it's by faith that you put in Jesus. But there's also a side to it where you need to work hard under Jesus, serving the world and serving people. And I don't know what your scenario is, but I'll just tell you what mine is in our church. We have a very high percentage of people who serve in ministry. Because from day one, we have always said, if you're going to be part of our church, you better do something. And so what we do is, if, you're, if it's your second, third week at Village, and you're not doing something. I don't, counting the offering, seating people, being on production crew, being a community group leader. I don't know what it is. If, if you're two, three weeks into our church and you're not doing that, we shame you <laughs> relentlessly. All right? You should feel horrible about your life. All right? You should question your faith. You know what I mean? You're useless. All right? You're useless. You're just weight. You're dead weight. We're a battleship. We're trying to kill the enemy here. And you're just taking up space. So either get to work or free up your seat. <laughs> yeah, because I think that's, remember, I'm the prophet type, not the, and then our pastor will care pastor comes up and says, it doesn't really mean that. It just means he loves you. He cares about your soul. Uh, so, but no, but that's true, because the reason is, is because Jesus looks at us and goes, you better work. What is he affirming of? I know your works, your toil. You better be tired. If you're in church, you better be tired. You better go home tired. You better be tired in your life. You better not stand before me at the end with a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of energy and a whole bunch of stuff you didn't expend on earth. When you get to heaven, die with your boots on. Die busy. Die working hard. That's what he's saying. I want you to work. I want you to find your place in the church and serve and serve and serve. And so we, we did a series last fall. Um, where the church grew by a bunch of people very quickly. And so what we did is we looked out and we said, we need a bunch of you to step up and serve. And uh, in one day, we had, about, we had a goal of about 350 people stepping up that day and telling us where they could serve, when they could serve, all that. And that day, between the services that we had, there was about 850 people that signed up and said, okay, we'll do something. All right, now some of that was just shame because the person next to them, you know, was writing something down. They're like, well, i got to write something down. And then, you know, we called them and we never heard back from them because they're just dead weight. But um, what we called them to, 800 of them signed up to do something, probably out of that about 400. So the point is, is that if you're, man, hear Jesus talking to you right now. Toil, 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 work. Now, some of you are like, well, where would I work? What would I do? I don't understand what my role is. So here's what I want to do for the next few minutes. I want to take you um, and unpack uh, basically a little workshop that I do uh, for our church in a class called Foundations, where I take them through uh, their spiritual gifts, or I take them through the spiritual gifts of the church, and I explain each spiritual gift, and then I just basically ask them, you guys think through, write down, pray, ask people around you, what are your gifts, so you can figure out what your role is in the body of Christ so you can work and toil well when you get back to your respective churches, if that's not something you've done. So, um, there's about three or four different lists in the New Testament that talk about spiritual gifts. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, Romans chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4. So let me just 
break down a bunch of these gifts and quickly explain them and you just think through your life and you try to figure out whether this is you. Okay? Um, just really practically speaking. All right. First from Ephesians 4, uh, he talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. So, an apostle. An apostle type, uh, literally in the Greek, it's one who is sent. So, modern day missionaries, modern day church planters, modern day um, um, leaders of movements, of networks of churches. So, an apostle like Paul would go into Philippi and he'd raise up leaders, he'd teach the Bible, he'd gather a church, then he'd move on to Rome and he'd do the same, and then he'd move to Ephesus and he'd build these churches, he would oversee networks of churches, and he would be a visionary. He would be someone who would go into a place and go, I know exactly what kind of church this place needs, and so I'm going to build it up, and I'm going to, so some of you might be church planters, right, sitting here right now, you're in a job, but you're stirring, you don't know, I, I'm an apostle type, I'm someone who's sent, I'm someone who's supposed to organize, I'm someone who can cast vision, and, may, and, and, and literally, for me, I was sitting in a crowd just like this, it wasn't at a summer camp, it was at a conference, and a guy got up and he spoke about church planting, and that's what it took, and on the spot, the Holy Spirit went, boom, this is what I want you to do. There's been a few times like that in my life, one of them was to go to Bible college, one of them was to marry my wife, and one of them was to plant a church. It was like, okay, this is what I need to do, it's very clear. So maybe that's you, right here, you're sitting, you're stirring about what you're supposed to do, God's calling you to be an apostle. Secondly, there's a prophet. Right? We talked a little bit about prophets yesterday. They teach the Bible. They, they're, they're hard on people. They yell, they scream, they tell everybody to repent all the time. And uh, they don't have a lot of friends. Uh, so maybe that's you. Right? You're like, I don't have a lot of friends. Maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a prophet. There might be other reasons. You're a jerk. Uh, all right, then there's evangelists. Evangelists are people who, uh, who just literally... They're not just people who have a passion to share the gospel. These are people who actually see people turn to Christ. They actually make this, they watch, they lead people to Jesus, right? So a great example of a modern day evangelist is Rick Warren. Those of you who know Rick Warren, I saw someone reading Purpose Driven Life uh, back there today. Um, Rick Warren is the kind of guy, I'm not kidding you, who will, he leads a big church in California. He will go to a grocery store and he will see three people come to know Christ before he's at the till. No joke. This is just, he's like, yeah, I'm buying tomatoes, now I'm accepting Christ. I'm buying diapers, now I'm a Christian. I walked in a peg. And, you know, because he just has this gift. Now, don't put yourself at that level, because, you know, then no one's an evangelist in here. Uh, but, do you see people come to know Jesus through your life, through your sharing? Do you have a passion to see this happen? That's an evangelist, all right? Then there's shepherds. Shepherds are caring people. They love people. They care for people. They want to connect people, right? And so, hey, I see you. You're new to the church. You need to connect with so-and-so. I care about you. I care about your life. I care about your soul. I love you, and I'm going to take care of you. That's a shepherd. And then there's a teacher. A teacher is one who takes concepts and makes them live for people. Takes the Bible, makes them live, breaks down principles. Maybe that's your gifting. All right. Uh, that's from Ephesians 4. Then there's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And there's a few of the more charismatic gifts in here. So, uh, first one is wisdom, okay? And what Paul means by wisdom is special knowledge or information from God supernaturally. So these are people who just are so prayerful, so in the scriptures, so kind of connected to God that, that when people come up to them with situations, they are able to speak into their life almost like God is giving them words for that person and so this has happened a few times in my life. I don't claim to have this particular gift, but the, this, these examples have happened in my life where uh, I remember I was, uh, I was an intern at a church and I was uh, on the computer one day and a lady came in and no other pastors were there and I was only an intern. And they came upstairs and they said, would you, you know, there's a woman here, she needs to talk to somebody. And I said, well, she going to talk to me? I'm like 22 years old, I don't have any. And she's like, they're like, yeah, you know, you're the only one here. <laughs> And I was like playing solitaire or something. I was like, all right. So I walked down. I'm like, sit down. I'm like, hey. She's like, so when am I going to see someone with authority? I'm like, eee, that's me. Let's go. So, so she's like, okay. And she just starts like confessing all this. She actually said she was in an adulterous relationship. She was driving by the church. And she felt God telling her to come in and confess to somebody. And so I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm in over my head. Like, I'm, I was just playing solitaire. And now you're, we're doing this. And this is very serious sounding. And so I just said, look, man, I don't, know, I don't know what to tell you. I don't have experience in this. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pray for you. And in that moment, when I started praying, I started praying stuff in her life that I never could have possibly known. 
All right, and she was just like, started breaking out crying. She's like, how did you know any of this stuff? And I was like, I don't know, man. The spirit was just, just, just firing. I was like, I, wanna, I want this gift all the time. But when that prayer was over, it disappeared. I didn't know where it went. I was like, I want to be able to go, hey, lady, bam! Hey! You know, uh, so that would be a cool gift. So if you got that gift, run with that. It's good. Um, now, this gift can be uh, misused. And that's why people have, have tended to stay away from it. Um, I have a friend who has, who really functions in this gift, um, but what he, when he was young, he would, he would give words to people very quickly and not think about them. So there was one couple that he knew who was, they had three, they had three miscarriages and they had come to him and they had been talking and, and then they got pregnant again. Of course, those miscarriages were devastating and then he said to them, uh, I got a dream, I got a word for you, I know you're pregnant again, and don't worry, this, is, this one's going to last. And so they started, you know, building a, like a room, they started painting the room, and they were like, yes, this word from the Lord, you know, this guy walks in this gift, and I know it, and then another miscarriage, and they were devastated, devastated, and he was, and so at that point, he said, you know what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk in a bit of wisdom, I'm going to take any word that I get that I feel for people, I'm going to put it on the shelf, I'm going to let it gather dust, just to give it time before I start walking in that stuff. So, um, so that's what he means by gift of wisdom. Um, secondly, he lists in 1 Corinthians 12, and you can go look up all these later, uh, the gift of knowledge. The knowledge gift is you desire information. You love reading books. You can retain information. You're able to explain information to people on the job of that. You love footnotes. You hate endnotes. You don't know why endnotes are there, because they're distracting when you have to go all the way back to the book. Whenever you see a little 12 on top and you have to go all the way back, you're like, eh. You like footnotes. You can just look down and read all that stuff. You're someone who loves, you have the gift of knowledge. You just love information, you love reading, you love gathering, you can retain and explain. All right, that's knowledge. All right, uh, third, he lists in 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of faith. These are people with a special endowment of faith. Uh, all of us, if we're Christians, we have faith in Jesus. Faith, though, uh, according to this gift, is someone, you, this is the person who's just like, it'll work out. It'll just, it'll, they got a smile, it'll, don't worry. It's like, yeah, I know, but we need to raise $20 million to build a building. We're going to get it. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's going to happen. And these people are uh, annoying at times because you're like, how can you be this idealistic and naive? We're not going to get it. We're going to have to do all this work. I mean, he's going to come in. Don't worry. A little bit of faith moves a whole mountain. <laughs> all right. All right. You really believe? Okay. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not that. Um, these people, I love these people. You need these people around because they keep you from going crazy and, and getting overwhelmed with all the stumbling blocks in front of you. I'm the kind of guy who sees a thousand reasons why something's not going to work before we even make a move. And these are the people who come in and they don't see any of that. They're like, of course it's going to work. Oh, yeah, we're gonna, someone's going to just drop 20 million in the offering plate. It'll be perfect. And then a piece of land will pop off. It'll be beautiful. All right, so um, awesome people. Some of you are that. Use your gift. Encourage people. Um, the gift of healing. These are people who pray for sick people to get well. They have confidence in it, and it actually happens. It actually happens. Now, here's what's interesting about the gift of healing. It doesn't happen all the time. People still die of cancer when someone with the gift of healing prays for them, and that's just God's decision. But oftentimes, these people have the gift of being able to heal people. And I'm not talking about guys in white suits up in front of the television camera going, you know, and I'm like, ah, heal. It's not that. It's this humble, the people I know who have this gift, very humble. It's very low-key. They're, they're constantly praying for people and they're healing. And the amazing thing is, um, you know, when we, we tend not to go to these people, this is very important. When we're sick, I think the church should function by way of you know who has these gifts in the church and you actually use them in this way. Instead of just going to anybody, which of course you can do, and get your community group to pray for you, of course, of course, of course. But just like you wouldn't go to somebody and say, hey, I want you to teach me a whole bunch of stuff if they don't have the gift of teaching, or I want you to lead if you don't have the gift of leadership. The people with the gift of healing should be used in the church in this way to actually pray for people and gather around people. And so there are people like that. This is not a gift that I have. Um, and the reason I know that is because uh, years ago when I worked at uh, Michael's Arts and Crafts Store, uh, I worked there uh, helping people with crafts. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I remember this kid, I remember very vividly, this kid, uh, he was in a wheelchair and he came and he was coming up the aisle at me and I looked at him and I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard God say, walk up to this kid and grab his shoulder and tell him to get up. I was like, what's that? <laughs> what? He 
He's like, just walk up to him and tell him to stand up, and he's healed. I'm like, okay, okay, here I go. Right? I'll make it, you know, I'll make it six, eight, five an hour. So if I get fired, I can figure it out. So I walked right up to him. I said, hey, how you doing? I'm Mark. He could see that because it says Mark with a smiley face. I said, how you doing? Good. I'm like, uh, okay. Uh, can I help you find some googly eyes? <laughs> no. I said, okay. And I walked away. Totally terrified. Scared. Didn't step out. Didn't try to heal him at all. That's how I know I don't have this gift. Because these people, they'll, they'll do it. They have faith to do it. And they'll pray for someone to do it. I don't have that gift. I don't know what happened to that guy. But I don't know if God was very happy with me in that moment. Oh, okay. Uh, next gift is, you were hoping that story, you were so disappointed. <laughs> Bam! Uh, I wish. All right, next one is discerning of spirits. All right, these are people who literally can discern different demonic spirits uh, among people, among situations, and be able to pray with people, counsel people to get those things out of influence in people's lives. Uh, speaking in tongues. Uh, I don't know where you fall on this, but basically where I fall on this is I do believe it's a prayer language and I do believe it's a, sometimes God can give a message to people through tongues, but you need to have an interpreter present who can say those things. And I don't think it should necessarily happen, you know, in a Sunday morning gathering. You know, there are people who come to me, you know, we gather four times on a Sunday with thousands of people and people come to me like, well, why can't I use my gift of healing? And why can't I give, use my gift of tongues? And why can't I use my, and, uh, and we say, well, there's only maybe one or two or three gifts on display on a Sunday based on what we're trying to accomplish. It's not a time for everyone to just start throwing their gifts around. And there are people who have tried it. They've prophesied off the balcony. And I've met them afterwards and said, don't do that. And they go away very quickly. Um, because I'm like, man, I'm doing, this is what my job is. I don't need you telling people what I just said. Like I, I literally, one day I was like, and I think Jesus is asking you guys to repent. And the guy goes, repent. I'm like, yes, that's what I just said two seconds ago. I don't need you saying it. So, uh, and so, so I don't think every gift needs to be on display uh, because then we would have the person with the, with the gift of helps just walking up and start putting chairs up in front of me as I'm talking. And it's like, this isn't the time. Why are you, I don't understand. Or somebody with the gift of, of giving who just starts, you know, coming up and throwing money. And it's like, no, there's an appropriate time for this and a context for it. You don't need to work out your gift right now. Um, all right, gift of helps. All right, gift of helps is a gift where basically you're somebody who's just, you love, love, love to help people. You're just, this is what you do. When you see an opportunity to help somebody, you help them. You thrive on helping. Our executive pastor has this gift. He's just always looking for somebody to help, to serve. There's people who pull up in front of the church who have babies and they can't get out of their cars or whatever, and he'll just go park their car for them. I'm like, man, what are you doing? You're our executive pastor. What are you what are you, valet now? This is what he likes to do. He likes to help people, park their cars, make sure that if this is you, you have the gift of help. So, now, there's people who just help people, that's good. But I'm talking about the gift, the ability to discern it and do it constantly and enjoy it and love it and bless people through it. Um, then there's the gift of administration. These people are super organized. They're note takers. They're money managers. They control information. They like organize. Again, kind of, kind of like that king. All right, they love Excel spreadsheets, pie charts. They love all of those things. The gift of administration. Um, the gift of service. These are people who just love, love, love to serve. Opportunity pops up to serve. Like, they're, they're on every team in the church. All right, kids ministry needs help. Boom, got it. All right, production team, got it. Community group leader, got it. Community group host, got it. Everything they do, they just love, love, love to serve. And uh, for us, we, we as a church, obviously, we kind of filter out different people, and we don't let people serve in everything. So we have people who, because we don't, you know, we, we kind of take a cue from Jesus, where Jesus wasn't fair to everybody, like I talked about in the first fireside. And so if somebody wants to do something, they don't necessarily get to do it. So we'll say, you can go on the parking team, but you can't serve in kids' ministry. And they say, why can't we serve in kids' ministry? Sometimes it's just a feeling. It's like, we don't know, you're creepy, so you can't. But you can go greet people. <laughs> that takes no skill. Just shake hands. It's perfect. All right. Um, service. Okay, and then there's teaching. Teaching gift. We already talked about that. Unpacking ideas, so on. Then there's exhortation and encouragement. Some of you have the gift. The ability to discern when someone needs to be encouraged with an email, with a Facebook message, with a note, with a Bible passage, with a prayer, or whatever... And you function in it constantly. You just encourage, encourage, encourage. 
I love you. You are so essential to the body of Christ, especially when we live in a culture that functions with what some writers call the hermeneutic of suspicion. Everybody's negative, everybody's down, everybody's suspicious, everybody's critical because you look smarter if you can find holes in things. These people don't function like that. They're constantly positive, constantly encouraging. They're just like, man, you killed that. That's awesome. You got to do this. I, we need to do this. Hey, I, God's telling me this for your life. Encourage, encourage, encourage people. People need it, right? You and I can all agree with this. You have been blessed by a time someone has come up and encouraged you, right? Be that person for people because they're not getting it anywhere else. And so the gift of encouragement, very important for the body of Christ. Uh, and then there's giving. Uh, Paul talks about giving. This is a gift where you people just are generous. They, it's not that they're rich. They're just, they're just, there's some rich people, they're very generous. Some poor people, just very generous. You see an opportunity, you want to help people. You want to buy that person that airline ticket. You want to you give money. And, and ministry, I mean, functions based on people like this, right? Churches stay open because of people like this. Because it's like, man, I just want to bless this. I want to give this. I run into money. It's not my money. I want to give it away. I want to give it away. This is a gift. And Paul's whole ministry functioned because people were willing to actually pay for him to go and do all these travels. And so uh, this is a gift that God gives people. And so if God has put it on your heart to write big checks for people and give money to missionaries and churches and people, you know, spread the kingdom, this is a gift that you need to function in. Uh, leadership. Uh, the gift of leadership. Some of you are just gifted leaders. People follow you. How do you know if there's a leader? It's not if they say they're a leader. Because uh, lots of people now in Canada, in America, most people think they're leaders. Right? How many Americans do we have? Put your hand up. Americans? All right, we've got a few. We've got a few. All right. Americans just kind of, it's in their blood, like we're leaders. It's like, if you go, if I go to a church conference and there's all Americans in the room, I say, who's a leader? I'm like, Whoa! I go in Canada, I say, tweet? <laughs> I know, I'm not, right? Because we're passive. We like, we, we don't let it raw. We don't, you know, we just like to chill, maple leaf style, right? So we're just, that's how we are. And so, but a leader, a leader is someone who doesn't say they're a leader. A leader is someone where you look behind them and you see if they have followers. And there's just people with the gift of leadership. They get up, they can pitch anything, and people go, I'm coming. I'll die for that, sure, whatever, let's go. Right? That's, that's a leader. And the church needs uh, many of those. And then, uh, lastly, Paul talks about mercy. The gift of mercy. The people who have a sensitivity to the emotional hurt of others. They can see your hurt and they can minister to it. Now, let me give you really quickly um, how you can discover these particular gifts in your life. It's an acronym called DESIGN um, that one writer comes out with. And it's basically this. The D stands for desire. What do you want to do with your life? What are you passionate about? What do you consider the perfect job? Secondly, experience. How has your past experience in life informed what you should be doing? Thirdly, what are your spiritual gifts? Fourthly, what is your individual style? Meaning you might be a teacher, but is it for adults or for kids? Uh, fifth is your growth phase. Are you a new Christian or are you a more mature Christian? If you're a new Christian, you probably shouldn't be an elder, as Paul talks about in 1 Timothy. But there are many other roles you can do. If you're a mature Christian, maybe that's the job you take. And then your natural abilities, right? What are the things you're just naturally born into that you love, that you function? All right, let's wrap up this letter to uh, the city of Ephesus. We have six minutes. Okay, here's what he says. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. You cannot bear with those who are evil. Here's a great sign from God that your heart is being renewed and transformed into the image of Jesus. That, that sin actually makes your heart break. You feel it. And so what he's saying here is here's a really good thing about you. When you see sin around you, it impacts you. Right? Uh, uh, David talks about in Psalm 119, My eyes are flooded with tears because the people around me break your law. Do you care when people sin? Do you care when people rebel against you? Do you feel it? Here's what he's saying. I love that you cannot bear with those who are evil. Now, there's a, there's a balance to this. Because if all you do is say, I cannot bear with those who are evil, you're going to remove yourself from being among those people who you're supposed to be with. So um, one, one, one story I remember when, when our first daughter was really young, we had a neighbor and he used to go on his front porch and just swear all day on the phone. 
Just swear, 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 swear. So we were out there one day and our little, you know, two, three year olds like listening. She comes in, she's like, swear, swear. And we're like, whoa, what's going on here? Earmuffs. So then we started to go, oh my goodness. So then their little kid came out to play with her in the playground and he started, he's like three years old, he's saying all these crazy words, right? And we're like, oh my goodness. Well, initially we said, man, we hate evil. So let's keep our daughter away from playing with him because he's going to influence her, right? That's what we do. That's our natural inclination. But then as we began to think, we're like, wait a minute. Why does he do this? Because he doesn't know Jesus. They don't, they don't have any idea what this is about. And so instead of removing ourselves, let's put ourselves in their life and be salt and light what God has asked us to do. Right? That's the tension of life. And so on the one hand, yes, he's saying, yes, you cannot bear with those who are evil. I love that. On the other, he says, you've got to be salt and light. You've got to be in people's lives. And he says this, but you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. He says, I know... Verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. You have not grown weary. It's a beautiful phrase. It is difficult at times to not grow weary of following Jesus. Right? The gospel becomes old. We've heard it a thousand times. We know what this is. It's, it's let's move on to something else. And he's saying, you know, you know what I'm, I'm encouraging you is that you haven't grown weary, man. You've never gotten bored of this. You've never got bored of this. And then he says this, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. You used to love me. I was your first love. Me, Jesus, I was your first love. And you've fallen away. You have left me. This has become, you, you had me at, at the top priority and you've walked away from me. Now, this might be people in this room, right? Our church is full of people who, when they were a kid, when they were a teenager, whatever, they loved and followed Jesus, and they walked away, and they stopped caring. What he's trying to do is he tells them to remember, and I talked about this a couple weeks ago at church, but it's like when you started dating someone, and you were really into them, and you loved them, and you talk all night, and you write poetry, and you dance, and you do all these amazing, you go on trips, and it was vibrant, it was alive, and you had just met, right? And fast forward 10 or 15 years later, you're married, and things are not like that anymore. It's just growing stale, you're not sure, da, 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 all of that. Here's what he's saying. It's growing stale for you, but can't you remember when it was new? Can't you remember when you read the scriptures, it was alive? Can't you remember when you prayed, and you really believed it was going to happen? He's saying, do those things again. Can't you remember what it was like to really be passionately in love with me. That's gone, and you need to get it back. That's his message to this church. You need to get it back. And I remember when Aaron and I dated, man, early days, it's alive, alive, alive. And then you gotta try to find, I mean, she, she would pick me up for dates, because she drove and I didn't. She walked me to my car, and she wooed me. It was brilliant. It was, it was fantastic. And then 10 years down the road, she doesn't pick me up anymore. <laughs> he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, which means turn back and do the works you did at first. If not, he says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Let me close by giving you an example of a guy in the New Testament who fell away as a warning to every one of us. There's a guy named Demas. The Apostle Paul says this in Philippians chapter 1, or Philemon chapter 1, verse 23, he says this. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, and Luke, my fellow worker. Okay, that's Philemon 1. Colossians chapter 4, a couple years later, Paul says this. Our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea. Five years later, he writes 2 Timothy 4, and he says this. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas has deserted me because he loved this world. Here's the thing. People fall away all the time. People give up on following Jesus. People fall out of love with Jesus all the time. You know family members. You know friends. What's the reason? Nine times out of ten is what Paul says about Demas. They love the present world more than they loved him. That is the constant threat in every single one of our lives. That you love the world more than him and you're going to desert him and you're going to leave him. And the point of this letter is to hold over us a warning. Don't do it. 
And when you feel yourself drifting, repent, remember, and do the things you did at first. Father, it is my prayer that as we wrestle in regular life, as we raise our kids, as we uh, work our jobs, as we work on our marriages, as we uh, go to school, whatever our lot in life is, that in the midst of those distractions and in the midst of those, those busy scenarios, that we would never allow our first love to become our second or third or fourth. And it's a constant challenge that we would find ourselves 10 or 15 years from now totally not compelled by you at all, not interested in serving you at all and what you're doing in the world. I pray for every single person here that that is not our legacy, that we would know from a, from a text like this, from a letter like this to this church, that the most important day is not the first day, but the last day, that we start a lot of things in our life. We start marriages and companies and, and different things. The most important thing is not to start something, but to finish well. And I just pray for every single one of our faiths that we would persevere and finish well so we can stand before you and hear those words, the, the, the well done, good and faithful servant. You've persevered. Let none of us be Demas. None of us desert you because we love the present world. It's so easy. Guard our hearts from it. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. All right, hope you have, have a great day. Uh, please fill up the box, and we'll do Ask Mark Anything tonight, and you guys control the content. So ask any question you want, and we'll pick it up tonight.